Welcome to the O Show. I'm Laura Babcock. A recent national poll has Canadians concerned about immigration. A vast majority are concerned that it's contributing to our housing crisis. And while a number of people in the poll also support the idea of immigration for the economy, it is raising some concerns. And here on the O Show, one of the things that I've been noting is a change in the narrative across the country and political discussion. Anything around homelessness or the housing crisis that I post is usually met with some sort of a blame towards immigration or refugees. And so joining me here today is Rashed Afif. He is the new CEO of Wesley in Hamilton. And Rashed, it's wonderful to have you on the program. Thank, thank you, Laura. Thank you. I appreciate it. So what, what is your response to that from your lens? Uh, have you seen a change? Are you concerned? And, and what should Canadians understand about the situation? Thank you, Laura. Yeah, it, it breaks my heart what's, what's happening right now in housing and, and homelessness. And I can't believe a country like Canada is dealing with housing and homelessness, uh, a rich country with a lot of land and, and possibilities and opportunities. Canada, we are still dealing with housing and homelessness, and and I and and in my personal life, I've gone through a lot, and I know when there's a crisis, usually the most marginalized people are, are to be blamed for the crisis that happened, not because of the the marginalized people. Like refugees are an asset for any country they go. We know as soon as a refugee lands in any city, you could see that the that the culture, the 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 the, the businesses, everything in that city changes in a more positive way. And you could easily see it in cities like Toronto or Vancouver, or so you could see that that cities are more diverse, there are more better workforces, uh, better creativity, uh, and housing. Housing is an issue, but it's not because of refugees. It's because of our reactive uh, uh, reaction to the problem. I think we should have looked at our policies procedures ten years ago, not now for another ten years. Right. So I want to talk about the numbers that are coming in because, you know, there's a lot of calls to put a halt on it. Um, but first, before we get into the immigration targets by the prime minister, you mentioned Toronto and there was a big story. I was away in Europe, I think, this summer when the story broke about refugees who were sitting in a tent city in Toronto in the pouring rain because there wasn't adequate accommodations for them when they arrived. And they come in with complex uh, health needs, as we know, come in with PTSD often, uh, and all kinds of other needs. And so to have refugees sitting on the street, Olivia Chow got on it urgently, and, and there was some action around that. But just yesterday, when I was on a panel about this in Toronto, Rashad, there was a conversation we were having kind of during the break about, you know, the difference between asylum seekers and refugees and immigrants and the importance of not kind of bundling it all into one conversation. Can you just for our Osho audience, just clarify the differences as, so that we're having this conversation intelligently and in a fact-based manner, not in a way that kind of lumps together these various circumstances? Yeah, unfortunately, there was another uh, incident happened in Mississauga last week that one of the refugee claimants uh, was sleeping in a tent outside of a shelter and, and they passed away. And Unfortunately, and it breaks my heart when I see that refugees are on the streets or in, a, in our shelter system. So the refugee claimants are um, individuals who came to Canada and then they they ask to be a refugee in a very simple simple language, as opposed to uh, if, uh, let's say government assisted refugees, where government of Canada, which UNHCR, would decide that these are the families from other countries and they send them to Canada. Okay. So. Uh, Yes, and I'm happy that there are some steps has been taken to, to uh, address the issues of uh, refugee claimants. I think I think these boxes are not, not needed. I think we do have to work in any level of government, either federal, provincial, or municipal, to make sure no one, no one, including refugees, should go through this, this uh, hardship of homelessness and, 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 and through the shelter system. Because what I'm concerned with is you, you make the point that often the most vulnerable are blamed for problems in society and the housing, lack of housing stock is a Canadian planning failure, uh, if it's anything at all. And what I'm concerned of is refugees being blamed or newcomers being blamed and targeted as somehow, you know, responsible for Canadians in this affordability and housing crisis, not having access 
to um, housing and to shelters. And I've had this conversation with very compassionate people who up until recently would have not said out loud, well, we need to take care of our own first. And yet I'm hearing that, Rashad. So is that reasonable according to the numbers? Or do you think it's just an easy scapegoat for people who are feeling fear and stress and not sure how to navigate the economy? Yeah, I think I think as a if you look at the history, we do see that usually the most marginalized individuals are being blamed for any more macro level issues like housing. I, I don't see refugees be a problem for housing. I see refugees to be a solution for our housing. Uh, uh, I can give you hundreds of examples of refugees we help and, and assess settle in Hamilton and Brantford and other cities that now they are they are this uh, you know they have their own companies. They are building houses. They are innovating houses we do need them like the, there's no way we can survive without bringing uh, refugees to to canada we need refugees to come here and refugees i always look at refugees as an asset and as a, from a businessman it's an asset for canada you bring this young people you bring these families with kids who are going to diversify our culture diversify our our society and also uh, uh contribute to to the economy of our country like uh, i had uh or I have a lot of uh, clients who came to Hamilton and now they're all staff. Or, or, or there is actually, I always give this example of, uh, there is this franchise restaurants right now in Hamilton that's being led by this family who I had the privilege to work with them as a refugee when they first arrived to Hamilton exactly 10 years ago from this year. So now they're like a billionaire, multi uh, franchise stores and, and a lot of people, a lot of my friends are now working for for them. So that's, I think that's the story we have to share about refugees, that refugees are an asset to any country. It's us how we are using these assets. Mm -hmm. It's us and our policies to think how we can use these assets for the Canada and the economy benefits. The other example is like, uh, we have the highest number of, uh, for example, physicians who are taxi drivers in Canada while we have a shortage of nurses and, and physicians. So again, it doesn't, it's not the problem of that physician coming here. They do want to work. They want to be contributing to the country. It's the policy is the issue, right? How can we make it easy and use this talent and use this skill set for the benefit of us, for the benefit of our community and in general in Canada? So it's an issue then in part of being able to fast track these licensing issues uh, and to, to understand what's happening. Because to your point, I was getting gas and I talked to my attendant all the time, but this issue came up recently. And he said to me that he was a trained physician. And then after 10 years of pumping gas, he's given up on working. And this when we're hearing about physician shortages and communities suing physicians who don't stay you know it's like it's and half of what half of the workforce can't get a family doctor in ontario i think is a statistic i heard recently i mean it's madness and so so part of it i take your point Rashad, is let's get licensing in place let's let's use refugees and their talents and their skills to contribute because they want to you know uh they're in canada so what do you feel about the targets for immigration because the trudeau government set them at about i think four hundred thirty-five thousand. it's going to go up to five hundred thousand, and it's going to stay at that level but people are looking around saying our food bank usage is through the roof and we've seen that some students from other countries are part of the reason for that we're seeing that there just isn't the kind of uh ability to find even rent uh and so it's causing all kinds of consternation and we're hearing stories of people living multiple people living in small units i mean so families are sent and if i've been reading some international uh, media, especially India in particular, uh, headline after headline about how Canada is failing international students and the, and the conditions in this country. And it's shocking. It's shocking to see that. Um, and you can't help but think that that reputation is going to further damage our economy as we move forward if we don't get a handle on this. So, I mean, what is it? Is that, is that number too high? Is it just the fact that we've kind of Put the cart before the horse. We we invited people in and we didn't have a plan. How do you how do you see it? Um, it's, I think it's interesting, Laura, when you say in the Indian uh, in India uh, social media or or media they they say in the, like a failure Canada as a failure. I think that's that's interesting because in Canada we see refugee as a problem, right? Outside of Canada they do see Canada as a 
problem, right? I think that that gives us a sense of, you know, it's not the issue of refuge, it's the, the issue of system thinking and how we could put the right system in place to use. Do we need half a million refugees every year? We do need that. We do need because we have a shortage of, you know, uh, a shortage in our labor market, a shortage in our health market, right? Even in my own organization, we are always struggling hiring because we don't have the, you know, enough uh, applicant applying for a job. So, uh, and, and then my question is always like, yes, we worried about the food bank, but why if you should go to a food bank? Nice. You know, like, because like, if we are, if we have a good system, why if you should go to a shelter? The first thing they tell me, I want to work. Right. And then we put them in a shelter and this chronic shelter, like chronic homelessness, you, you basically guide them to, 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 to become a chronic homeless. And then, then you're going to be reactive. You don't have a time to, to sit back, have a home, rest, and let your mind settle, and then start thinking, how can I contribute? They're in a survival mode. They left their country. They came here to, to gain some safety and also contribute to, to, to their new environment. And then we put them in the shelter system. And we basically create another, another generation of people living on a street. So that's my point. And no, 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 no refugee would be interested in going to the food bank if we provide them the opportunities to to work and and to thrive. Um, an unhoused person a year in Canada is like fifty six thousand dollars. To your point earlier about multiple visits to the emergency rooms, and there's even a hospital in Toronto that just set up kind of a, a bunch of containers outside for people to stay in temporarily because they come to the emergency room so often it's cheaper just to visit them in the parking lot. So, uh, so I mean that we've issue identified well here. Our issue identification, I think, is uh, good, and everybody understands the, the extent of the problem. When you talk about systemic changes and the fact that we shouldn't accept that homelessness should be a chronic condition or that refugees should go into the shelter of the food banks, I just want to touch with you about youth homelessness, because in my uh, research on homelessness, the changes that are happening now in Canada are they're seeing more older adults who have lived in poverty their whole lives, but because of rent evictions are now ending up actually unhoused on the streets. We're dealing with an opioid crisis. We're dealing with an overrepresentation of indigenous people in homelessness, and we're seeing youth in homelessness. And uh, I can tell you a number of the youth that I have met through my children are to me at risk of being homeless in the next couple of years, uh, depending how they finish high school and what their options are. They're, you know, they're in precarious housing already. Um, and so I'm deeply, deeply concerned. I know Wesley has a program specifically around youth and homelessness. Where are we at with that, Rashad? And how much do Canadians and Hamiltonians need to understand, you know, the urgency and the and the the real scope of the problem? Uh, it, it is a big problem, and it 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 really worries me when I hear a child or a youth is going to the path of homelessness and chronic homelessness. So. Again, we, we have talked about the root cause, right? We did talk to a lot of people on the street who were successfully housed and who were not successfully housed. And we, we asked them, like, tell, tell us more. Tell us like what happened, why you are homeless, why you are successfully housed and why you're not. A lot of his stories, a lot of things that came was quite common was that youth time to be homeless. Mm -hmm. So that ch children and youth time is a golden time that you either build the resiliency, provide a safe place for them to stay and, and grow and learn and then start contributing to the community or just leave it uh, and take our hands off as a, as a system, as a government and just let the non-for-profit organization carry, carry this more uh, Canada-wide responsibility. Yes, we have a uh, youth housing. It, we have been, we had this youth housing for the last 16 years. It's an amazing uh, program where the, the youth who are homeless or at the risk of homelessness would come to, to the program, stay there, learn the life skills, and then it's a stage-wise, they go to the next stage, which is more uh, independent living, and then we help them transition to permanent housing. But imagine if you wouldn't have that one, then there are lots of more uh, youth would be in, end up being in the shelter system. And once they're in a shelter system, they become chronic chronically homelessness and to a lot of risk. 
There are lots of risks. There's a risk of addiction. There's a risk of sex, sex trade work. There's lots of risks out there for our youth to be to be on the streets. And as, as you mentioned, like $56,000 for any person living on the street. So uh, as a system, we need to think and we need to be more proactive and, and provide a place for our youth. You did give the example of a, a person who came years ago and, and they, they came to Hamilton. And you know, I think that's what we should do. Like, uh, 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 I always tap into the resiliency of youth, the resiliency of our clients or newcomers. I cannot stay outside for two hours in this cold weather and they live on this cold weather outside. So imagine how resilient, how strong they are. And unfortunately, they don't have any other option. Yeah. Like no one wants to sleep on this city. No one wants to stay hours and hours to get a, a, a bag of food from a food bank or, or our youth, what our future. It worries me when I get old, and I think I have to work all my life because we are not very proactive. If we are saying refugees are, we don't need refugees. We have a lot of problems. We cannot take care of the people who are on the street. We are not taking care of our youth who are the future of this country. We do have to worry about our future when we get older. Who's going to support us? Probably we are going to end up being on the street with the way we are going right now. Uh, it's terrifying, and you you make an excellent point. I mean, not only do the youth need our support because it's a critical time, and they're at high risk, uh, much higher risk than adults if they're in the shelter system um, to exploitation, and, and they just don't have all of the skills. Um, but even for the future, for our future, I mean, if the youth are not able to, to get jobs and to be a productive part of society, what happens to the society itself? We had... Uh, uh... A youth came to our uh, years ago to our this uh, youth supportive ha supportive housing, and now they are a lawyer. Wow! So uh, I, 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 it's it's such a promising story for me whenever I hear it. So that's what we need to do as a as a country, right? We have to create an opportunity for everyone to have a safe place, yeah. to 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 get the right supports and and have people to trust and build a rapport and then move on with their lives. It's not an easy task. For a, for a country like Canada, with a lot of money, a lot of land, it's not a big task. We are making it too big. Right. I think the system should start building more houses. We should work on credentials of for, uh, like uh, 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 refugees coming to our country, open the doors for them to work. We should have a place for youth to stay safe, fit, and go back to school and learn, and then, and then build, build Canada. It's, it's not a big problem if we put the right investment. You, whether you want it or not, Canada is going to spend money on this. If you want it or not, you're going to invest money on housing, homelessness. So it's better to do it in the right way. Build more homes. Build more homes and let them live there. Give them a place. Give them a place of a su support where it's transitional. They learn all this because they build this rapport with the, with, with the community and then move on to the next level of their life. Uh, there are lots of examples around the world. You you just mentioned that you came from a trip. You don't see this crisis. Right. In a country, in a country that their economy is way, way behind us. But, yeah. you know, it's, I, I think we have to learn. We have to learn how they are doing that. And it's not a, it's not a, it's not a hard thing to do. It's just, we have to look at our, some of the countries who have successfully done that and just implement it here in Canada. And there's so many examples. I remember when we were in Rome uh, at the Rome train stations, because there's people coming from all over the world and they have a lot of people who are unhoused. They actually provide a room to give showers and clothes and dignity and, and a charger for their phones. In other words, give them a place to rest in safety, you know, rather than kicking them out and constantly moving them out of sight. They, they welcome the opportunity to meet people's needs where they are. And when it came to the food bank issue, uh, a social worker in Rome was quoted as saying in an article I read, you know, in Italy, no one goes hungry. There's always a slice of pizza available. You know, they can go to any kind of restaurant and just get a slice of pizza. It's not, yeah. I mean, the idea that we've accepted and kind of pushed the problem out of sight and keep moving it further and further away and, and into these, you know, we don't want to look at it. We don't want to deal with it. But I got to tell you, uh, I cannot drive anywhere on the Hamilton Mountain without somebody begging in an intersection for money. And I've never seen that before last winter. And when people say to me, well, you know, it's a business, I'm like, really? 
what who wants to be in the business of spending eight hours a day freezing right that's not a business that's a survival technique and it's something that we shouldn't accept as normalized in canada uh, so to your point it's going to cost us anyway as a society we need to give the investment to youth and the investment to newcomers whether they refugees or asylum seekers or our target for you know for immigration we need to have it set up for them. And it, it sounds like you're advocating a housing first strategy, the idea of get them sheltered, get one point where you can take care of their complex needs, it's much more affordable. Uh, and we've seen other countries do this with success, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm gonna take away from this conversation, Rashad, something you said that I haven't heard anyone else say before, and that is the importance of a place to rest important to know that you have a place to go to rest at the end of a day mm -hmm. you can get up the next day and accomplish anything if you yeah. have rest but how many of us couldn't function if we if we didn't if we didn't have that place to go and crash at the end of the day um uh, that's very powerful it reminds me of abraham maslow's hierarchy of needs you, you know shelter being mm -hmm. one of the basic um before yeah. anything else so thank you so much Rashid, for for both your experience and your insight into this issue and your compassion in this conversation, because I think that um, speaking about it from a heart place, as you have been doing, uh, is, in, is critically important. The problem is bigger than it is in our minds, as you said, we can tackle this, we're going to have to pay for it anyway, let's be proactive, but let's also speak about it with compassion, because these are people who want to work and want to be a part of our society, and we just have to help them have some support to get started. Thank you for the work you do at Wesley, Rashad. Really Thank you, Laura. thanks for having me. And for all of you who subscribe to The O Show and help us produce this community content, thank you very much. We'll continue to have these important conversations as we navigate a better Canada and a better Hamilton going forward. Thanks so much. When you care about current affairs, it's on The O Show. And when you want to get clear what's going on here, it's on The O Show. If you like to stay in the know, tune yourself in to The O Show. It's The O Show. Laura Babcock's The old Show. With a lot of great guests, she puts them to the test on The O Show. There's no doubt they'll be calling them out on The O Show. Stand for something or fall for it all. Ontario, hear the call on The O Show. It's a podcast, The O Show. Laura Babcock's The O Show. Stay informed with The O Show, O Show.